The Snake by Stephen Crane Where the path wended across the ridge, the bushes of huckleberry and sweet fern swarmed at it in two curling waves until it was a mere winding line traced through a tangle. There was no interference by clouds, and as the rays of the sun fell full upon the ridge, they called into voice innumerable insects, which chanted the heat of the summer day in steady, throbbing, unending chorus. A man and a dog came from the laurel thickets of the valley, where the white brook brawled with the rocks. They followed the deep line of the path across the ridges. The dog, a large lemon and white setter, walked tranquilly meditative at his master's heels. Suddenly, from some unknown and yet near place in advance, there came a dry, shrill, whistling rattle that smote motion instantly from the limbs of the man and the dog. Like the fingers of a sudden death, the sound seemed to touch the man at the nape of the neck, at the top of the spine, and change him as swift as thought to a statue of listening horror, surprise, rage. The dog, too, the same icy hand was laid upon him, and he stood crouched and quivering, his jaw dro dropping, the froth of terror upon his lips, the light of hatred in his eyes. Slowly the man moved his hands toward the bushes, but his glance did not turn from the place made sinister by the warning rattle. His fingers, unguided, sought for a stick of weight and strength. Presently they closed about one that seemed adequate, and holding this weapon, poised before him, the man moved slowly forward, glaring. The dog, with his nervous nostrils fairly fluttering, moved warily, one foot at a time, after his master. But when the man came upon the snake, his body underwent a shock, as if from a revelation, as if all he had been ambushed. With a blanched face he sprang forward, and his breath came in strained gasps, his he chest heaving as if he were the performance of an extraordinary muscular trial, while well, his arm with the stick made a spasmodic, defensive gesture. The snake had apparently been crossing the path in some mystical travel, when to his sense there came the knowledge of the coming of his foes. The dull vibration perhaps informed him, and he flung his body to face the danger. He had no knowledge of paths. He had no wit to tell him to slink noiselessly into the bushes. He knew that his implacable enemies were approaching. No doubt they were seeking him, hunting him. And so he cried his cry, an incredibly swift jangle of tiny bells as burdened with pathos as the hammering upon quaint symbols by the Chinese at war. For indeed, it was usually his death music. Beware. 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 The man and the snake confronted each other. In the man's eyes were hatred and fear. In the snake's eyes were hatred and fear. These enemies maneuvered, each preparing to kill. It was to be a battle without mercy. Neither knew of mercy for such a situation. In the man was all the wild strength of the terror of his ancestors, of his race, of his kind. A deadly repulsion had been handed from man to man through long, dim centuries. This was another detail of a war that had begun evidently when first there were men and snakes. Individuals who do not participate in this strife incur the investigations of scientists. Once there was a man and a snake who were friends, and at the end, the man lay dead with the marks of the snake's caress just over his East Indian heart. In the formation of devices, hideous and horrible, nature reached her supreme point in the making of the snake so that priests who really paint hell well fill it with snakes instead of fire. The curving forms these scintillant coloring create at once upon sight more relentless animosities than do shake barbaric tribes. To be born a snake is to be thrust into a place a swarm with formidable foes. To gain an appreciation of it, view hell as pictured by priests who are really skillful. Well, as for this snake in the pathway... There was a double curve some inches back of its head, which, merely by the potency of its lines, made the man feel with tenfold eloquence the touch of the death fingers at the nape of his neck. The reptile's head was waving slowly from side to side, and its hot eyes flashed like little murder lights. Always in the air was the dry, shrill whistling of the rattles. Beware. 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 
The man made a preliminary feint with his stick. Instantly the snake's heavy head and neck were bended back on the double curve, and instantly the snake's body shot forward in a low, straight, hard spring. The man jumped with a convulsive chatter and swung his stick. The blind, sweeping blow, fell upon the snake's head and hurled him so that steel-colored plates were, for a moment, uppermost. But he rallied swiftly, agilely, and again, the head and neck bended back to the double curve, and the steaming, wide-open mouth made its desperate effort to reach its enemy. This attack, it could be seen, was despairing, but it was nevertheless impetuous, gallant, ferocious, of the same quality as the charge of a lone chief when the walls of white faces close upon him in the mountains. The stick swung unerringly again, and the snake, mutilated, torn, whirled himself into the last coil. And now the man went sheer raving mad from the emotions of his forefathers and from his own. He came to close quarters. He gripped the stick with his two hands and made it speed like a flail. The snake, tumbling in the anguish of final despair, fought, bit, flung itself upon this stick which was taking his life. At the end, the man clutched his stick and stood watching in silence. The dog came slowly and with infinite caution stretched his nose forward, sniffing. The hair upon his neck and back moved and ruffled as if a sharp wind was blowing. The last muscular quivers of the snake were causing the rattles to still sound their treble cry the shrill, ringing war chant and hymn of the grave of the thing that faces foes at once countless, implacable, and superior. "'Well, Rover,' said the man, turning to the dog with a grin of victory, "'we'll carry Mr. Snake home to show the girls.' His hand still trembled from the strain of the encounter, but he pried with his stick under the body of the snake and hoisted the limp thing upon it. He resumed his march along the path, and the dog, walked tranquilly meditative at his master's heels.